Okay, um, my name is Melissa Connolly, and I'm with the Child and Family Policy Institute of California, and I'm here to support this workshop session. So um, I want to just start by saying thank you for being here. The session is being recorded. Please put yourself on mute and then raise your hand or put something in the chat if you have a question, and I will help monitor the chat and make sure your um, question gets accommodated. Um, I am very excited to introduce our speakers today who are from Chapin Hall and who are going to be talking to us about the Family First CQI framework for California. So please join me in welcoming Yolanda Green Rogers, Jennifer O'Brien, Claire Kimberly, and Lexi Matter. And Chapin Hall team, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. All right. Well, good afternoon. Everyone, give me just a hot second here. So yeah, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to our session on a Family First Continuous Quality Improvement Framework. Uh, we wanna thank you so much for joining us today for this session. Uh, before we get started, I think some of you may have accessed it already. We'd like to make sure you all get into the Mentimeter application uh, so you're ready to go as other engagement exercises come up during the session. So while I'm doing uh, introductions and a bit of housekeeping, we'd like you to access the Mentimeter app application using the QR code on the screen or going to the website and entering the code. A map should come up and we'd like you to put a pin on the county where you work. Now we know the map is a bit small, so try to put the pin maybe near your county. And this is really low pressure. Uh, if we can, we just like to get a sense of how much of California is represented in this session today, and really to make sure you can get into the application. Uh, while you're doing that, I'll get us started. My name again is Yolanda Green Rogers, and I'm here with my colleagues, Jen O'Brien, Claire Kimber Kimberly, and Lexi Matter. We're from Chapin Hall. Uh, we're a research and policy organization headquartered in Chicago. Uh, Chapin Hall has research and policy staff deployed all across the country. Uh, we collaborate and partner with state agencies, community-based agencies, state and local government, as well as philanthropic organizations uh, to find evidence-based solutions to pressing child welfare uh, challenges, challenges in youth homelessness, early childhood education, and other human service fields. We've had a team working uh, with LA County on Family First Implementation and other major initiatives for several years now. Uh, members of Chapin Hall Center for State Child Welfare Data have provided the evidence-driven growth and excellence or EDGE training to child welfare leaders in California for a number of years. And most recently, we entered into a partnership with CDSS uh, to build the CQI framework to measure and monitor implementation of the Family First Prevention Services Plan, which you'll be hearing a lot about today. So let me check in. Claire, are we ready to, to show that map, maybe? Uh, go ahead, Christine. Do you have a question? No, OK. Yep, here is the map. And again, if you're not able to get to it, that is fine. We just wanted to, to mess around with it to make sure that it works. You can see we have definitely a few more up here, but all across the state. Great. Okay, so we got good representation here in this session. Uh, next slide. So during our time together this afternoon, we want to accomplish three things. Uh, Claire will provide an overview of CQI, what it is and what makes it work to help us all level set and make sure we're on the same page about how we're thinking about and talking about continuous quality improvement in the work we're doing with California and other jurisdictions. Uh, Jen and Lexi will introduce the measurement framework we use when working with jurisdictions on monitoring evidence-based programs as part of their Family First implementation. And they'll take you on a deep dive into each of the four components that make up the framework. And then I'm gonna come back around uh, to round out the discussion with the focus on strategies for using the data and evidence gathered through the measurement framework to actually plan and implement improvements. During the session, please feel free to put questions in the chat and we'll respond in real time. And if there's time at the end, of course, we'll also answer questions. There'll be polls and questions throughout the session to get your engagement and feedback, as well as a handout we'll provide a little later. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Claire uh, for the overview of CQI. 
there are no questions. Claire, over to you. Yep, perfect. Thank you, Alonda. So you'll see on the screen, um, both in the slide deck and in Mentimeter, we kind of wanted to get an understanding first of our general level of understanding of CQI. Um, as Yolanda mentioned, that's going to be our brief introduction here. And so it'll depend how much time I spend on giving a review on CQI based on our level of understanding with this group. So if you could take just a couple of seconds and give us a good um, understanding of our audience, if you will, so that we can adapt accordingly, would appreciate it. Okay, perfect. So see about 18 responses so far. Okay, wonderful. So I'm going to go ahead and assume it looks like a majority of us do know the basics of CQI. Have a handful um, that are what is CQI and a few for I'm an expert at CQI. So I'm gonna follow that lead and adjust these slides based on that information. So I'm gonna spend just a few minutes going over this. I'm recognizing that this is the general infrastructure, if you will, overview of CQI. There's definitely more we can dig into, but we wanna to get to that family first CQI since that's the focus for today. So just think of this section as a foundation uh, of how we define CQI. I will speak to it as more of like a statewide um, foundation and then we'll get into family first specifically in just a second. So what do we mean by CQI? I know that we love our acronyms. So CQI, Continuous Quality Improvement, is what that stands for. You'll see some proper definitions there on the screen now. It's identifying, describing, and analyzing those strengths and problems. And then after that, testing, implementing, and learning, and revising, and making solutions to those problems. We also know that for a wonderful CQI system, um, we sometimes associate CQI with specific things, and I'll talk about that in just a second, but it's actually a very holistic approach to how we improve our processes. So we look at you know, our mission, our visions, and our values when we look at a CQI infrastructure and how we move work forward. And then we also wanna make sure to make it the best it should be. We need to make sure that we have those diverse voices giving input on those work as it moves forward. For if we only have you know, one group of people saying something, then it's not gonna help them reach all of our families and all of our coworkers in making changes. So that is our broad definition of CQI. The next slide here gets into why we do CQI. I'm actually going to jump to the bottom first. I know that we are um, in a field where we definitely have policies we need to follow. Um, we have check marks we need to check. So let's just be upfront and say that state and federally, we require CQI. Um, we have APSR, we have PIP, we have CFSP, et cetera. And there's all of these foundations that we have in which we have to show that we're doing CQI. Um, so that is a requirement there. Also accreditation and funders also need to show that we're actively improving our processes. So that is another requirement that we have. But the top is sometimes things we don't always think about. So let me just talk briefly about those three boxes there. We know that sometimes there's something that may hit the news, um, that this is right now a problem that we have. And so we need to instinctively fix that problem. So that reactive and impulsive decision that we have, and I'm not sure, I may not be the only one getting feedback. I'm seeing some nonverbal. So if you're not muted, if you could please mute, that would be wonderful. Um, so the impulsive decisions we sometimes make of we need to do something now um, will be what I call a band-aid fix um, that may help the problem immediately, but that's not going to make those long-term cha changes that we want to see. So we use CQI to help make those long-term challenges changes. Utilizing evidence to guide decisions rather than just saying firsthand, this is what I'm thinking is happening. Rather than doing that, we need to make sure we build that infrastructure with data to make evidence to inform those changes to make them long term changes. And then finally, a systemic approach to solving problems, as I alluded to before, having diverse perspectives, having a holistic approach to recognizing the problem and solving them will also obviously make a more bigger beneficial change there. So that's why we do CQI. So setting the stage for CQI, you're going to see a visual there in the right. I'm going to dig into that for just a second on the next slide. And um, colleagues, if you see that in chat, um, feel free to uh, react there and I'll get to it if we need to. 
but setting the stage for a good CQI, we need to make sure there's a coherent set of structures, policies, and procedures to understand that me in this role, how can I contribute to this process? How does that relate to my coworkers, to leadership, to stakeholders in the community? So making a clear structure, procedure, and policies is what's gonna make a great CQI system. And then one thing that I think we instinctively think of when we hear CQI is that improvement cycle. For those who are not as familiar with the improvement cycle, there's a lot of different types and Yolanda gets to that at the end. But essentially it's looking at that problem, analyzing the problem, understanding the root causes, um, approaching it and making improvement strategies, then bringing it full circle back of what did we try. So it's, it tends to be a circle. So you'll see an improvement cycle there in the visual. We need to have a strong improvement cycle with clear communication throughout um, to make a great CQI system. So bear with me. I think this is my last slide for this overview for CQI. So we're going to break down that um, triangle, that visual in the right corner a little more here. You're going to see the organizational commitment to CQI. If we don't have that foundational, that governance structure, that leadership that's really uh, the basis of our CQI, it's not going to go much further. Um, so we need to make sure that we have that strong support. And that includes the agency culture too, right? So you can have leadership saying it, but if we do not have supervisors, if we don't have caseworkers talking about it, then it's also not going to move forward. So a big foundation of CQI systems. And then resources, what we need to support the CQI moving forward. Is it how to analyze data, how to report data, how to communicate with people with lived experience and make sure that their voices are valued. That is a resource that is needed to help move the CQI system um, forward. Next one, again, I, I know I've told my colleagues this numerous times, I, I laugh about how much we connect to data. That tends to be CQI data. And yes, data is a huge component of CQI, so we should also recognize that. Um, the way data is collected, data quality is huge. The way it's feeding in makes a big difference, and that's both quantitative and qualitative. So with our CFSR, with our case reviews, um, the <laughs> high quality of the data, the better how it's analyzed and routinely analyzed to look for those different changes. And then those reports, not only translating that information to those beautiful visuals, but also making sure those visuals are able to connect to actionable changes. So the ability of people to interpret those reports to help develop those improvement strategies and to see whether or not those improvement strategies have made those improvements. And then last but definitely not least is that CQI plan. So the goals and the outcomes, again, statewide, we have these wonderful measures and we also have family first measures that are very clear. These are our goals and outcomes, but how we reach them can vary. Um, so making sure that we recognize those and align those with our CQI plan and processes. Um, making sure the data collection and the methods are clearly articulated. Sometimes case reviews are better than quantitative um, analysis and so making sure we define those. And then improvement planning and processes so get into that feedback loop too, right? So how do we communicate that these are, are moving forward? So I think I had myself on a timer and I think that was about right. And I do see some questions in chat. So while I look at that, we actually do have another Mentimeter. So I will go ahead and pull that up. Um, note that there are four different ones there. So if you're on your phone, you may need to scroll down a little bit. But if you could give us an understanding of how your CQI infrastructure, how you're feeling about the confidence in your position and your role with engaging those CQI practices, interacting with those data and reports, um, the improvement planning. Um, so how do we know that we want to improve something? So what's the process of planning that improvement um, strategy? And then also discussing how to improve our work. So are we in an environment where we're able to engage those um, interactions with other stakeholders and to help inform those improvement strategies? So I'll give you um, just a minute or so to respond there. And I do see some responses. Can you repeat the stage? Look at chat. Okay. I think we're good, Claire. I Perfect. think. Yep. 
you know, Landa laid a great foundation for the other types of frameworks, then mentioned the PDSA cycle that's built into the framework. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so we can see there um, the three point. So this is on a five point scale. So we can see how we are feeling there. So it's great to see that we're understanding our roles and practices and understanding access and data to report. And then it looks like some of our challenges may be that improving planning approach, methodology, and then including relevant stakeholders. Okay, so I know that my colleagues will be able to incorporate that more as we move forward, but I also know our audience here is here for the family first. So let me transition to Jen. and We'll lead to our next section here. Thanks, Claire. Okay, fantastic. Um, keep putting questions in the chat. Um, raise your hand, happy to entertain things as we go through, but I'm excited to introduce the measurement <laughs> framework. Oh, do we have a question? Yeah. Okay. okay, introduce this measurement framework for you developed by Chapin Hall colleagues in partnership with Child Metrics uh, to assist jurisdictions in their implementation of Family First. Um, I want to also let everybody know, though, this isn't specifically applicable only to Family First. This is easily adapted and utilized for any implementation efforts. So we're hoping that you get excited by what you see and you think of this as a usable tool for any of your future implementations. Um, throughout this session, this section of the workshop, I've got about 30 minutes, Lexi Matter and I are going to introduce and define each aspect of the framework and provide examples from work that we're currently engaged in across the country. So with that, we'll go on to the next slide. And this is reinforcing some of what Claire was just talking about in the specific aspects of the systems features. So before we really look at the framework, let's just circle back for a minute and make sure that we understand these are critical to driving your CQI improvement cycle. And that you really wanna make sure that you have the ability to measure and monitor initial and ongoing implementation of any of your prevention efforts that you use a framework, the one we'll introduce today might be your option, you might have others, to produce the information needed to fuel the improvement efforts. So by information, we're gonna talk about the data, we're gonna talk about the evidence that you'll need to fuel those improvement efforts. That you wanna establish routine forums with a diverse array of partners to engage in improvement planning. We need lots of different voices. We are not the only ones delivering the EBPs within our counties or any of the prevention efforts. There's cross-system partners, there's providers, there's CBOs, there's FRCs. How do we make sure that we have their input and they, those diverse array of partner voices at the table for improvement planning? We always need to make sure that we ensure race equity is centered and constituent engagement is intentional. Ensure local prevention CQI efforts are connected and aligned with your bigger CQI efforts and your other state transformation work. So let's take a look at the framework. Um, on the left-hand side of the screen, you see our cover page. This is the measurement framework that can be adapted for any jurisdiction. So we have that big bold, right? It just gives you an opportunity to make whatever um, edits, changes, adaptation to this that you might want. I think Lexi is going to try to drop a link in the chat for you all to our measurement framework. And then you can pull that down and access it and use it however you want. But also, please know that this is a one piece of a larger family first toolkit that we've been developing and partnering with other consultants um, across the country to Make sure that there's a toolkit, there's resources that go deeper than even the measurement framework. And so Lexi's also going to put a link to the landing page on our Chapin Hall website where you can access any of these additional resources. On the right hand side of the screen, what you'll see is the four components that we've been mentioning that are built into this framework. So capacity, reach, fidelity, and outcomes. And before we move on, let's be clear about what this framework is intended to do for you. It provides the infrastructure you need to produce the data 
and the evidence. You're gonna hear us say this again and again and again. The data and the evidence that you need to enact a CQI process or a CQI improvement cycle. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. And we'll do a little bit of um, a deeper dive into capacity, one of our first measurement um, components. Okay, so anybody familiar with NERN, the National Implementation Research Network? Right within our framework, it makes sense to overlay other driving pieces of the puzzle when you're thinking about what you need in order to stand up a CQI improvement process. So NERN's active implementation framework is actually built in here as key components and drivers of our CQI framework when you think about the component of capacity. So when implementing Family First Prevention Services or any of your CPP prevention services, there are a number of capacity measures to consider. Staff, we need them to stand up implementation teams. We need to think critically about the clinicians that we might need and the capacity that's needed to deliver each of the interventions. Training, we have to prepare our workforce through training, through coaching. Um, it might be on, on data systems. It might be on referral processes, the array of prevention services available to them. All of those things might need some aspect of training and coaching. IT infrastructure, we need to be able to track the referrals, the uptake, who chooses to join us in the intervention that they're referred to, invoices, reports, federal claims, linkages to other partners' data systems. As I said earlier, many of these EVPs might not be within the child welfare infrastructure. So how do we make sure that we're linking and we're gathering the data that we need from the other data management systems of those who are actually delivering any of the prevention services? Administrative, um, facilitative administration. Let's unpack this for a sec. An administration committed to facilitating success. That's what this is all about in the NERN um, active implementation framework. So how do we set up on an administrative side the ability for us to be successful? We need the resources to support the staff. We need to work at an administrative level to remove barriers. We need clear policies and effective communication and critical feedback loops with all of our different constituents so that we know what's working for them, what isn't working for them, and a commitment to problem solve and make improvements as we continue to go through our implementation and our sustainability. And then the last critical component here is systems interventions. And that's talking about the ability to recognize no one system owns an intervention. We must partner and collaborate with cross systems and community stakeholders to really, truly understand capacity. Okay, let's move on and do a little bit on reach, and then we'll start looking at some examples. So reach measures help us understand who's getting referred, who actually is getting the service and taking us up on the opportunity to engage in an intervention. Who's dropping out? and who's truly um, turning down the service as a whole, right from the get-go. With all of that, we can begin to better understand um, what are the components, and, and by the way, all of this must be tracked, all of this, like who's engaging, who's being referred through another set of data points. What is the gender of those individuals? What is the ethnicity? What is the race? So that we can begin to understand who completes it, why do they complete it, and what does that say about our ability to really impact change for families? So ultimately, it helps us answer critical questions about what's working for whom. So I'm going to turn it over to Lexi here, who's going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into the REACH measures. All right. Thanks, Jen. Um, and I apologize, everyone. It wouldn't be a virtual meeting without some technical difficulties. So my camera isn't working. Um, but happy to be here and walk through some of these examples more um, deeply. So as Jen just said, REACH is really looking at how the service is reaching that target population. So the measurement framework that we've um, co-developed with Child Metrics suggests four measures and sub-measures to really understand REACH. And these measures should really be collected both at an aggregate level across all EBPs as well as by each individual EBP. 
So before looking at these suggested measures, I do want to note that some services, and really it's those well-supported EVPs, will have their own recommended reach measures. And so you'll also want to look at what those are and make sure that you're including them as well. So the first suggested measure is related to eligibility determination. So of the children who are eligible for prevention services, we want to capture three things. How many were identified as a candidate for foster care? And remember, this is identified by the 4E agency. Um, how many were identified as a pregnant or parenting youth? This is based on a federal requirement. And then we also want to know how many were not identified, either as a candidate as defined by the agency or a pregnant or parenting youth. It's just as important to understand who's not a candidate as it is to understand who is a candidate. And you'll see this reflected throughout the rest of our suggested measures. You know, understanding why something didn't happen is just as an important part of our CQR process, and you really don't want to skip it. Uh, it's also important to disaggregate this data, as Jen had mentioned earlier. You know, at a minimum, you'll want to understand it by time, either region, jurisdiction, spa, age, race, and ethnicity. The second suggested measure is looking at referrals. So of children identified as a candidate, how many were referred to the EBP, and how many were not referred to the EBP. Of those who were not referred, we want to understand a bit about why. And so it'll be important to look at, is it because there's no service available? Is the service available, but they don't have the capacity to accept the referral? Or another reason? Again, don't skip on collecting this data. It's important for your CQI process and understanding barriers to service referrals. And also, make sure that you're looking at it by time, region, and demographics. The third suggested measure is looking at service uptake. So of children identified as a candidate and referred to an EBP, we want to know two things. Who started the EBP, meaning who completed at least one session, and who didn't. And again, for those who did not start the EBP, we want to dive into some additional information about why. So is it because the referral is still in process? Were they placed on a wait list, which may suggest that there's a provider capacity issue? Did the provider reject the referral, which may suggest that there's a mismatch between the candidacy eligibility and the provider or program eligibility that you'd want to address? Was the provider unable to contact or engage or get consent to start services with the family or something else? And so specifically, if the reason that the child or the family didn't start the EBP is because they were placed on a wait list, you'll also want to collect data regarding how long they were on the wait list. Uh, this can be best understood by looking at median days and range. Again, I want to emphasize how important it is to understand why the referred candidate did not start the EBP. The onus to collect and understand this data is not on the provider, it's on the 4E agency. Again, remember to collect this data by population, you know, looking at who the candidacy population is, time, location, and also demographics. The fourth suggested measure is capturing service completion. So of those identified as a candidate, were referred and no longer are receiving the service, we want to know who completed the full EBP, so all required sessions as defined by the program or purveyor, and who didn't. And for those who didn't complete the full EBP, why? It's, was it that the provider was unable to contact or engage the family, or the family withdrew before completion? Was it that the family was no longer eligible? Did they move out of the service area, or did conditions change that impacted their eligibility? Was it a provider capacity issue, or something else? Again, remember to collect this data by population, time, location, and demographics. And I'll turn it back over to Jen. Thanks, Lexi. So let's pause for a second and just see if there's anything in the chat that we want to circle back to or questions that folks might want to come off and um, ask specifically related to capacity or reach or the framework. Happy to entertain those and take a pause for a second.
Brooke, yes, please. Hi, um, I'm very interested in how it's is it possible to use what we'll call community defined practices if they are based on uh, research because some refugee or hard to reach populations are not best reached using an EVP. Yeah, I fully agree, Brooke. There's, I, I um, was answering in the chat, I don't know if it came across, but I think within the CPP process, I know that there was a lot of encouragement to meet with community members and to diversify the array of interventions that, you, that the counties wanted to include based on the needs of the community. That EVPs are one piece, but they might not be the right fit to your point, Brooke. And that really it's, it's trying to figure out how we raise even the evidence-based long-term of the community grassroots interventions that might be already in place and working tremendously but we just haven't had the ability to do the research or we haven't had the ability to, uh, the funding, right, also is a piece of the puzzle, to move those further along into a clearinghouse of sorts. And so I know that there is a, a commitment to make sure that really what we're doing here is putting together CPPs that can meet the community's needs. And I know there's a lot of counties that have pilots and different uh, homegrown efforts that they're trying to raise up through this process. I think it's a really great point. And again, the framework that we're covering today, even though we're using a lot of family first language and we're talking about evidence-based practices, we really believe wholeheartedly and have seen multiple jurisdictions use this for other interventions, community interventions as well, because you still need the critical data. You still need the critical evidence to tell you that those are working for the folks that are receiving it. So don't feel like this framework is only for EVPs. Absolutely, thank you. And thank you for that clarification because I, it has a tendency to be um, referred to as can only be an EVP. So thank you. Absolutely. No, really appreciate you raising that. Any other questions? And help me team if you see other hands. Okay, Yolanda, Claire, Lexi, anything else you wanna to add to the mix before we press on? Okay, fantastic. So let's take a look at Fidelity. And again, if folks want to come off mute, please feel free. I think that this would be a, a fun session. I know we're a big group, but we welcome your input and questions as we go. Um, so Fidelity measures, big, huge piece, again, on the EVP side, but a lot of community interventions too. You, you, you want to know what it is that we're delivering and you need there to be clear parameters of what it is right and so that's what fidelity talks about it's the extent to which the intervention was delivered as intended some ebp going back for a second developers purveyors are actively involved in fidelity monitoring some of them might require um, observations recordings audio the use of skills demonstrated and even scoring. You think of something like motivational interviewing. There's a lot of monitoring of those skills to be sure that you are actually doing the model as intended. Other purveyors, developers, folks might require users complete a periodic self-assessment. Um, PAT is a good example of that. Every single provider who's delivering that model has to go back and do a self-assessment on an annual basis to describe what it is that they've included within their um, active demonstration of PAT with families. What's common across all prevention models are guidance into the three things you see listed on the page, process, quality, and capacity. So process, how frequently does the intervention need to be offered? Is it every week? Is it um, availability seven days a week, something like home builders. Um, how long is the intervention? Is it a 12 to 16 week kind of intervention or is it more of an intensive four week session? And the time it takes um, for the intervention to be completed. Quality is the way that they want you to track that the service is delivered as intended. And capacity is the, they oftentimes will say, um, a full-time clinician can um, manage 30 
family cases at one time, you know, um, at simultaneously and part time, maybe 15. That's probably on the really high end, right? of an intervention that's probably on a bi-weekly basis that they're engaging a family. Some other interventions, again, you think of home builders where it's intensive for four weeks in home, they might only have like seven families max that they can work with at any given time. So the parameters of fidelity can be vast, right? And they can change based on the model. And so process quality and capacity is important to understand. Okay, we'll take a look at the next slide. So family first requires states to clearly outline how every single intervention will be monitored and tracked to fidelity. CDSS and Chapin Hall are currently in a process in which we're mapping all of the fidelity requirements and developing a plan for how the data will be captured, stored, reported, and used to inform improvement strategies. Okay, remember that's the CQI piece, the improvement strategies once you get the data. The framework's going to make sure that we have the data and the evidence that you need to begin to have really robust conversations about what does it mean and how do we want to improve and what are the areas that we have gaps that we need to address or course corrections we need to make. And so all of that comes out within the framework as we continue on. So I'm going to hand it back over to Lexi, who's going to walk us through an example depicting how CDSS and Chapin Hall are currently mapping the fidelity requirements for one of the interventions in your California prevention plan. Give you a little sample. All right. Thanks, Jen. So as Jen was saying, you know, fidelity measures will vary for each EBP that your agency is implementing or non-EBP that your agency may be implementing. Um, so because of this, there aren't any universal fidelity measures that we can suggest, but we do recommend that for each fidelity measure that you wanna track a couple of things. And you'll see those as the headers on this table. So one, what form or instrument, instrument is being used to collect the data? Who is collecting the data and how often? Where is the data being reported? And where is the data stored? So as Jen said, I'm gonna walk through um, just an example um, of fidelity measures for one of the home visiting models, um, which is PAT or parents as teachers. So PAT tracks fidelity based on 21 essential requirements that they define. For each of these essential requirements, they also provide the measurement criteria or the indicator and I'll give a few examples of those on the next slide. Really, these 21 essential requirements represent the minimum or maximum levels needed for model fidelity, again, as indicated by the purveyor. The form or instrument that's used at an agency to track these individual indicators may vary based on the requirement. So for example, the program may track clinician training you know, differently than completion of family assessments. But the data as a whole is reported using the affiliate performance report, this APR. Um, that data, this data as a whole, all the 21 essential requirements are reported annually on this APR. And it's also uh, reported and stored on the PAT National Office Model Database. Okay, next slide. So here are a few examples of four of the 21 essential requirements. Um, we just chose some four, so these are, uh, there's no rhyme or reason. Um, but the first requirement is tracking duration of services. So the goal is that PAT programs must provide at least two years of services to families whose children are prenatal to kindergarten age. So the measure is just asking, is the overall program designed to provide at least two years of service to these families? It's a yes or no measure, and the target level that that program's reaching for is yes, they are. The second requirement is looking at the parent educator qualifications. And so the goal is that 100% of parent educators have at least a high school diploma, GED, or other equivalent degree. So at the agency, the measure is really looking at the percentage of parent educators with the required educational criteria. And so you can break that down based on less than a high school diploma, looking at you know, percentage and number with a high school diploma or GED, uh, some college without a degree, an associate's degree or bachelor's degree. But really the target level that you would be looking at reporting back in that APR is that 
Um, no parent educators have less than a high school diploma or GED. Sorry. The fifth requirement is really specific to parent educator or super, or excuse me, parent educator to supervisor ratio. Again, here, the goal is that 100% of full-time supervisors are assigned to a maximum of 12 educators. So you want that one supervisor to 12 educator ratio. The measure is just looking at the percentage of parent educators per full-time supervisor. And the target level that you'd be reporting on that APR is less than or equal to 12 parent educators to one full-time supervisor. Uh, the last requirement I'll share here as an example is related to parent educators in required training. So the goal is that 100% of parent educators and supervisors have attended the required trainings before delivering services to families. So similar to the first one, the measure here is just looking at have all parent educators and supervisors attended this required training? The yes or no answer. The target level that you'd be looking to report on is yes. So this same process is replicated for all of the 21 essential requirements for PAT. Um, and I'll pass it now back to Jen to talk a little bit about outcomes. So we're in the weeds here, kids, right? Like those, those couple of slides are trying to help demonstrate the importance of the process that we're currently engaged in at the state level. Right, all of the EVPs, there's 10 in the California Approved Prevention Plan, have guidelines. They have, they're well supported and they were identified by the developers as um, models that really have a lot of fidelity and outcomes, which we'll get into in just a second, specific requirements. And so we wanna map those out. We wanna be very clear and intentional that each county that goes forward has the data that they need in order to ensure the feds, as we claim, that all of the, the infrastructure is there to support the ongoing CQI that we wrote in the California plan and got approved would be in place. And so this is just ensuring that we're setting you guys up for success. And so going through that detailed process. Um, Sydney, did you want to jump in? I'm gonna mute that line just in case. Okay, so let's do a little bit of um, a further conversation about outcomes. So this refers to the extent to which the intervention is achieving the desired results. Oops, got a little bit of thanks. Um, the desired results for children and families. Um, outcomes can be prescribed by the EBP itself. So let's take something like BSFT, um, Brief Strategic Family Therapy, right? And, and that requires that the model will say that we're going to make sure that we are reducing mental health symptomology and we're improving function. And they will give a measure for you, each county that, that opts into BSFT, to measure whether or not that child's symptomology is decreasing and their, their functioning is improving. Whereas you can have other models where the outcomes can also be selected by the agency. Sorry, you'll get from the model purveyor some outcomes, but then you can also select other things like you wanna reduce child welfare involvement. And so in the California Prevention Plan, there is a lot of different specific outcomes that for each model that the state chose that are also in line with what the model developers are saying their model is capable of doing. There are two federally required outcomes, and then there's a, a third component that I'll mention. So the two federally required that each state has to monitor is from the date of a child's specific prevention plan, do they enter foster care within 12 months? Again, from that same date, do they enter foster care within 24 months? So 12 months and 24 months is the two federal outcomes. If they do, enter foster care at any point throughout that 24 months, then you also need to identify the date in which they, they entered foster care. So that's the, the little pieces that came federally in the legislation that says, we're gonna make sure that we know for those who had a prevention plan, how many kids will be able to preserve within their communities, within their home and not enter for foster care. Okay. Lexi's going to walk you through an example from another state, actually, in which we've been tracking outcomes that were selected by that state. So, Lex, back over to you. 
Great. Yeah, so I just want to reinforce what Jen shared earlier. We are getting into the weeds a little bit, but we're doing that to just share an example and show you how other states or jurisdictions are operationalizing these requirements. Um, so again, I want to start out and just say, you know, similar to what I talked about earlier with the fidelity measures um, and what Jen was just sharing about EBP specific outcomes, they're going to vary based on the EBP. And, you know, as Jen was saying, some of those well-supported EBPs have specific outcomes that that EBP is intended to achieve. You're going to find those in that manual or documentation or, or other um, places where the EBP is working. Also similar to the fidelity measures, we recommend tracking those same, uh, those same items for outcome measures. So what form or instrument is used to collect this information, who collects it and how often, where is it reported and where is it stored? So the example I'm sharing here, again, is not to be necessarily replicated for you per se, but again, is to share what Michigan has decided to use um, as part of their measurement framework based on what was in their approved prevention plan. And so for PAT, um, I, I pulled out just a few outcome areas and I'll talk through a couple of them. Um, so one of their outcome areas in their prevention plan was related to breastfeeding. So the specific measure that they're using is looking at the percentage of infants who were breastfed, um, breastfeeding at six months. And so, you know, they are using a visit tracker. Their um, home visitors are using a visit tracker. This data is being collected by the clinician at every visit. They're reporting it in a Michigan specific performance measure report. That's something that they've created and are using. And then the data is being stored in the visit tracker database. So another outcome area um, that was identified for Michigan is related to depression screening. The specific measure that PAT is using is the percentage of primary caregivers enrolled in home visiting for at least three months who were screened for depression within three months of enrollment. They are using the PHQ-9, which is the patient health questionnaire, or the Edinburgh postnatal depression scale to track this data. It's also being collected by the clinician at every visit. This too is being reported in that Michigan specific PMR report and is being stored in that visit tracker database. Um, so you can kind of see the, the pattern here and how this is working. Um, I'll go through two other ones quick. Um, so one, another outcome area is related to safe sleep. The specific measure that they're looking at is the percentage of children that are always placed on their backs. So this information, instead of a, you know, um, assessment tool, is just based on caregiver report, what the caregiver is reporting at every home visit to the clinician. They're still using that same Michigan-specific performance measurement report to kind of collect and report on this data as a whole. And again, it's all being or stored in that visit tracker database. Uh, the last example I wanted to highlight is specific to the parent-child interaction. Specifically, they're looking at the percentage of primary caregivers with children who are in the target range who receive an observation of parent-child interaction by the home visitor using a validated tool. And so the specific instrument they're using here is the PICOLO, which stands for the Parenting Interactions with Children Checklist of Observations Linked to Outcomes. It's a mouthful. <laughs> um, and that's used to collect this data. Um, again, it's collected by the clinician at every visit, reported out in that PMR, and stored in that visit tracker. So again, this is just an example of how Michigan is operationalizing their outcome measures. As Jen was just saying, California's approved prevention plan also identifies outcome areas for all 10 approved EBPs. And so, for example, for PAT, the outcome areas that were identified in California's plan, um, there's three of them. One is increased positive parenting practices, increased number of developmental milestones met, and then improvement of parent caregiver emotional and mental health. And so we're working, you know, with the state and with purveyors to identify which EBP specific measures um, should be used as proxy measures for these California specific outcome areas. However, 
this is also something that agencies can be thinking, can and should really be thinking about now um, to prepare. So for example, the outcome related to increased positive parenting practices, really start to think about what PAT measure or measures will you use to meet this outcome. All right, next slide. And so the last thing I just wanted to show you um, is an example of how this data could be displayed in a dashboard. So dashboards are not required, but they are really great ways to display data in real time, to share data with stakeholders, and engage in conversations around what the data means. As my colleagues were saying earlier, you know, CQI means not only collecting the data, but also looking at it regularly to really understand what it means and where changes are needed or how successes could be replicated. So um, happy to take any questions if there are about the um, fidelity outcomes or measurement outcomes that I just talked about. Um, otherwise, I can pass it on to Yolanda. All right, I don't see anything. Oh, Karen? Yes, hi, um, I'm Karen. I'm from Siskiyou County and um, we're the local child abuse prevention council, also the um, first five commission. Um, as I was looking at some of these outcomes, one thought that came to me is to really the critical importance of working with other partners who um, already collect this data and have systems uh, to collect the data specifically, as I think about the 58 first five counties, uh, county commissions who have similar priorities. Um, I think it's rather than starting a parallel system, really uh, working or exploring together with our county partners or with first five partners in this situation to um, use existing systems to enhance um, in, um, in, assur in assuring that there is um, efficient and effective ways to collect this data from all systems that um, need this specific outcome, those specific outcomes that you've indicated. Definitely, Karen. And you can't see me, but I'm vi like vigorously shaking my no, head no, no. with you. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, wanted to share, I think one of the things that Jen had pointed out earlier is like, this is not done in a vacuum. This is really done exactly. in collaboration with other partners, with other, with your programs that are providing the EBP. While the, you know, onus is on the 4E agency to be able to report out on it, you don't have to start this from scratch. And we definitely exactly. recommend that you don't um, and that you really identify who are the right partners that need to be at the table and bring them to the table to then collaborate on how, you know, who's collecting this data, where is it stored? How are we gonna get it? Do we need MOUs yeah. or other data sharing agreements in order to share it and start those conversations sooner rather than later? Exactly, I fully agree just because there's a lot of investments that can be a um, sustainability pathway for, um, for this effort. Right. Thank you. Hey, Lex, there's a question in the chat to um, see if you could add those three PAT California quality measures um, that I think the outcome measures that you mentioned. Could you add those to the chat when you're done here? Yeah, definitely. Fantastic. Thank you. OK, well, I will pick it up from here. Um, so as, as Jen and Lexi have mentioned, uh, they've been taking a deep dive into the uh, measurement framework. And so now I want to pull up a little bit and talk about how those measures really overlay and speak to actual casework practice by the agency, the state agency, and the provider agency. Um, it's easy to get caught up in the metrics alone, and the metrics, of course, are super important, that evidence, that data and evidence tell us what's happening, but it's also important to know that the data collected through the measurement framework provides the evidence needed to understand and improve casework practice, EBP implementation, as well as family change. So this slide, I'm going to kind of take it slow, it's just animated. This slide overlays the components of the measurement framework you just learned about with the quality practices that need to be conducted by, again, the state agency, 
uh, and the provider agency that they have to work together. So the work begins with the state agency making the candidacy determination in the realm of family first. And we know California is moving to community pathways, but in the family first realm, the state agency needs to make that candidacy determination to make sure the uh, child and family are eligible for family first services based on the candidacy definition in the plan. Then together with the family, uh, they discuss the, that case manager will discuss priority needs, strengths, or protective factors that would support the family, and then assess the family's needs holistically and establish a family and child-specific service plan that are clearly articulates the right array of services or supports that would meet the family's identified needs. Then there is the referral process itself from the child welfare child welfare agency side of it, completing the referral process and communicating all the necessary information to the service provider, discussing eligibility, potential barriers to family, to the family possibly attending or completing uh, services up front needs to happen. And you'll see just in this section where those reach and capacity uh, measures uh, where the data comes from, the actual casework practice that uh, is evidenced in that data that will be collected. Then there's the referral process from the provider side, which entails um, the provider receiving and accepting or approving the referral from the agency, then enrolling the family, and then the family actually engaging in the services. And I'll just mention here, we've seen across the country that this space here and even some places in the uh, child welfare agency data collection piece, we find families dropping off, which is why it's really important to intentionally uh, have methods and mechanisms in place to capture, excuse me, capture this data to make sure you're not losing families in between these casework practice points. Uh, so then the family begins the service. And those services, um, we wanted to make sure those services are being delivered with fidelity that Jen talked about according to model requirements and the family then continues or completes the service. The data and evidence uh, is being generated and monitored throughout this quality practice process at these critical case practice points and will ultimately lead to desired EBP outcomes as well as the overall child welfare outcomes that you uh, heard Jen talk about. And then additionally, family behaviors and perspectives should also be considered throughout this collaborative process between the state agency and the provider community really intentionally figuring out how are each of these steps working for the family? Do families feel like their opinions and concerns are heard, validated, and taken into consideration? Are they supported throughout their participation in the services? And do they bring up barriers to participation uh, that actually get addressed? And their qualitative methods, in addition to the quantitative metrics in the measurement framework that you want to engage in to make sure you're capturing how families are experiencing both the child welfare agency as well as the provider agency. Next slide. And so here, um, and I think we've been saying it all along, you really need to collaborate with a lot of stakeholders and partners during initial and ongoing implementation. Uh, building the measurement framework itself, figuring out what you're going to capture, how that's going to be done, should be a collaborative effort with your uh, program staff, with uh, IT and data analysts, with contract holders and providers, definitely lived experts, uh, partnering with your EBP developers, purveyors, and trainers. All those entities need to be involved in that measurement framework conversation so that you don't run into problems down the line. And then building in the race equity focus uh, will also be important for monitoring disparities in all of these key points in the process, disaggregating the data by race and ethnicity and other factors to really understand what's happening to children and families at each point uh, in that case practice process. Next slide. So here I'm gonna turn it over to Claire for a quick um, exercise to explore your thoughts about uh, some of these pieces. 
Yes, thank you, Alanda. So as we prepare this presentation, we realized at this point that there was a lot of information that's been shared with you that may or may not be familiar to you. So we want to make sure we have time to translate what we've shared with you to actions in your own your own counties. Um, so we are a little close on time um, and we were planning for that too. So one of our backups was to not get as much into discussion right now. But actually, what you'll find in chat, I'm about to send it through, is a handout that we have developed that can hopefully be something you take with you into your own professional settings to help guide those first set of questions to get this measurement framework set up. So you'll see on the very first page, you'll have a summary of the information that we've already shared. So hopefully that'll be easy to translate to those who weren't here today. There's a hyperlink at the bottom that will share you to or send you to our website for more information there. But on the second page, it actually goes step by step through the measurement framework and helps start those questions to engage with your coworkers, your data team, your CQI team, your caseworkers, your stakeholders, your EBPs, et cetera. So think of this hopefully as that tool of taking that first step of hearing and absorbing this information and moving that work forward. So again, apologize that we're probably gonna to need to skip over the discussion. Um, obviously, please use chat if there's more information you'd like to share with each other um, that would help move this work forward. But I'm gonna go ahead and hand it back to Yolanda because she also has some additional information to share um, regarding how we can translate this work into practice. Sure, thanks, Claire. Um, so now we need to activate the actual improvement process. Up to this point, We've basically, basically been talking about the fuel for the um, improvement planning process. So Claire, why don't you go ahead? It looks like that's going backwards. So if you wanna go ahead and just put that up or maybe, it's, okay. So the activation part of the improvement planning process starts with the engagement and service delivery. So that's the actual work that we talk about that's going on in at the local level with children and families, the frontline workforce, your provider community, county leadership, community partners, and your cross-systems human service uh, sector partners in the prevention work. That's where the work is happening. Next. We've talked about from all of that work, you're collecting data. You're collecting data on the capacity of the county around those implementation drivers that Jen talked about, staffing, uh, training, coaching. You're collecting reach data. You're monitoring fidelity to the evidence-based practices to make sure they're being delivered based on requirements. And you're collecting your outcomes data. And then at this point, you have to make meaning of the data and report it. So there's some level of analysis that needs to happen uh, at the local and at the state level. Uh, and then that information is reported out. And then where the magic happens is at the end here with the actual CQI or improvement planning process, where hopefully at the local level, there's a county cross-functional implementation team where the reports will go, where the dashboards, whatever uh, gets built to collect and report and analyze the information, those reports go to these entities at the local level for the actual uh, improvement planning process. Next slide. And someone asked earlier about a particular uh, QI method. And on the next slide, I'll talk about a couple of those. But the basic demands of the CQI process, and this your, my personal opinion, if you will, that if these demands are met, there, there are lots of different QI methods out there. But if you're identifying strengths and gaps in performance, basically, in essence, identifying the problem, if you're understanding underlying conditions or the root causes and being intentional about identifying the root causes of the variance in performance that you're seeing, if you're using those root causes to identify solutions, research solutions, and plan uh, for implementing what you think is going to solve the problem, testing that out and revising the approach, and using evidence, qualitative and quantitative, quantitative evidence all throughout that process, those are the basic demands of any quality improvement process. Next slide. So uh, what structure CQI process will be used? It's our understanding that the Plan Do Study Act or Plan Do Check Act, as some people call it, or PDSA cycles are used uh, quite often in California, but there's also DMAIC, 
which is define, measure, analyze, improve. There's RBA, someone mentioned in the chat, Lean Six Sigma, 4DX. There are all kinds of uh, methodologies. But again, if you if they if you adhere to those basic tenets that we talked about in the last slide, that's pretty safe unless there's some prescribed method that, you, that you're being asked to use. But the PDSA cycle is the, the cycle that we talk about most often. This slide was adapted from um, Dr. Wilson's work at uh, Chapin Hall, where you make observations from the data when you get those reports. You're looking at root causes, developing solutions, and then setting benchmarks and targets for how what, it, what level of improvement you're going to get to. You're implementing that solution and it's usually going to be processed either how you're doing something, how well you're doing something, or the, your capacity or the resources available to get the work done. And then you're studying, you're constantly looking at data and you have a mechanism and a place where you're having conversations about the data and the performance you're seeing. And then you're using that to act or make decisions uh, around whether you'll continue the solution or think of something different. So that was a super quick high-level overview of PDSA, again, which is one uh, quality improvement methodology. Next slide. So it's important to have a clear an intentional methodology. It's important for you to begin to think about where performance review and improvement planning will take place in your family first efforts. Hopefully you're thinking to yourself in what forms will performance data and evidence be discussed? Is there a cross-functional team that you have in place currently? Or is that something you're gonna need to do that includes frontline staff and supervisors? Uh, is it in meetings with providers? comprehensive CQI meetings that bring everyone together? Uh, how often are those meetings taking place? And, and who are the key uh, participants in those discussions? And so in a county-based system like California's, communication and feedback loops between the state and the counties is going to be crucial. In order for continuous learning to occur to support good statewide implementation of Family First and local implementation, establishing some intentional practice to policy uh, feedback loops is pretty critical. And that's pretty much what this um, slide is showing, that there's work that goes on to the right in the at the county level where there's CQI process there that need to be communicated to state leadership and state the state implementation team. And having this kind of... Uh, Practice the policy feedback loop will help you communicate progress, celebrate successes throughout the system at the state and local level, allow you to report systemic barriers that are prevent, uh, preventing or hindering implementation, figuring out where those issues need to be resolved, what needs to be moved up, uh, will allow you to report on actions taken related to uh, resolve or address past issues, and then revisit past decisions. So this, again, kind of back and forth communication. There'll need to be structures in place to facilitate that uh, kind of communication for continuous learning to uh, constantly be taking place. And then finally, just a quick um, uh, example of what it might look like. Uh, engagement and service delivery is happening at the county level. You're collecting your reach data, your fidelity, fidelity data may be aggregated quarterly from case reviews that you do or trainings or debriefings with providers, uh, or you might be receiving direct reports from the purveyor or developer. Uh, you're looking at agency capacity. Um, you want providers, contract holders to collect and report the Family First team uh, probably on a monthly basis. And then maybe biannually, you're looking at uh, those uh, outcomes and monitoring the outcomes. Uh, by purveyors and contract holders. You're analyzing the data and then engaging in that CQI improvement planning process, which could look like monthly implementation uh, or CQI meetings convened virtually with internal and external constituents where you're looking at data and evidence, again, identifying root causes, kind of going through that PDSA cycle. Uh, it could look like learning collaboratives conducted with EBP providers. Uh, so there may be for example, a PAT uh, learning community where those providers providing that service uh, come together to talk about uh, issues they may be facing and actually delivering the service. 
uh, CQI specialists are integrally involved reviewing and discussing the data at CQI meetings with contract holders and as well as um, with state agency staff. Next slide. And then finally, and I realize I'm kind of moving quickly at this point, uh, just think things to consider in that uh, last activity or in the handout. Uh, you're going to start thinking about uh, potential members and key resources for uh, CPP or CQI work group. Other tasks you may want to consider at the local level, are you going to need uh, MOUs or uh, randoms of understanding with sister agencies who hold uh, contracts with EBP providers in your county? Um, you're going to need to plan for contract amendments once MOUs are finalized. You may possibly need to uh, expand your provider service array by issuing RFPs and possibly hiring new clinicians uh, and planning for purveyor trainings. I think we put a slide or put a, a link in the chat earlier on where you can access the toolkit and spend a little bit more time with the uh, the reach measures and the different components of the um, of the measurement framework. And we will be available to um, answer questions uh, in the work. Uh, we want to thank you for your attention. We know this was a lot, but we will be around for the long haul uh, to support California, this implementation and, and applying these CQI concepts. We thank you for your interest in uh, learning about how CQI um, is really an important factor in- uh, Ooh, it's a lot of people in this one. Uh-oh. <laughs> any team members have anything you wanna round out the discussion with? Well, we thank- Happy to stay uh, on if people have questions. Yeah, yep. sure. I just want to say thank you so much to you um, and your team at Chapin Hall. This was a super informative session. I did download the chat, um, so I'm going to share that because there was some good info in the chat. And I sent out copies of the slides. If you did, if you requested them and didn't receive them, um, please email me melissa.connolly at cfpic.org. Thanks, everybody. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Melissa, for being here. Appreciate you. I do have one question. Sorry. I know you guys want to go to lunch. Uh, just a quick question. So um, from... I guess I'll kind of explain our situation. So San Bernardino County Probation, we're a larger agency. We have our own research unit. So as far as statistics is, is involved, they will do all the gathering for us and all of that, the fundamental work there. Um, from a managerial point of view, is there, some, is there something that I need to do on the front end I'm going to miss if I don't get them involved? I guess not involved in the right way, but ask the right questions in, creating all of our groundwork like the foundational parts of it like is there is there a like i don't know what i don't know so what am i not asking or what am i not doing in the beginning to make sure that we're going to be successful two years down the road we need to report out yeah so so kyle any hesitancy with literally putting the framework on the table and going through it with them so that you know what data they'll have access to and be able to bring to the table and build an understanding of what data they might not be thinking about, like capacity or reach. They might be really on top of fidelity and outcomes, but maybe they're not thinking about being able to concretely report who takes up the service, who turns down the service, who- That's, that's a good point. Turn right? down the service, I don't know at all. We just have yeah. who is actually showing up, who's enrolled, all the demographics on that, and then outcomes on the, those measures. Bingo. Okay. It's huge. So I think if you if if you look at the framework and all of the questions that are embedded, you might have like, oh, that's a good one. I don't know yet the answer to. And then you can pull those researchers and those folks to the table to to begin to sleuth through what they are 
tracking and what they aren't. Okay, cool. Yolanda, would you add anything to that or Claire? Lex? No, I think that's exactly right. And and really paying attention to those areas where families can fall through the cracks and making sure you have the right, um, as Lexi mentioned earlier, the the pieces. So again, just where they may fall through the cracks, outlining those places where, yeah, they did come, but then how many didn't show up and finding out the why around mm -hmm. those and making sure you're leaving space in your data collection to get at um, things that should happen and don't happen, that you're really trying to explore those. And, and Kyle, and to build on what our... Yolanda just said real quick, sorry, the, the, the really critical piece of the QI process there is how do we go back and better engage those folks that did turn us down, right? Because this is this is prevention and we're trying to prevent child welfare involvement holistically. So if they're turning us down, is it because they don't trust the voice? Is it because they, you know, they, they can't fit this into their family schedules, right? Like whatever those variables are, then how do we work backwards to address those? Okay. Go ahead. What were you going to say? I jumped in front oh, no, of you. I apologize. I was, I was thinking that's, that's exactly right. It's, so it's the improvement part that because we asked the why, now we can also just create a strategy for the improvement, which is going to change it going forward. It makes sense. Thank you. That that's greatly appreciated. I'm glad I, I stayed for the question part of it because I I feel like sometimes we're we're working in silos, and I know when we're implementing some of these, um, a lot of times we're not asking the why. The families just don't want to uh, decide they don't want to, and um, I know we we've been implementing Pat um, partnering up with Child Welfare. But at the same time, I feel like sometimes it's more of an intervention as opposed to prevention because these families have gone through the system, have had bad experiences, or for whatever reason, they are not prepared to address some of the underlying issues that um, the program will require. So I feel like sometimes it's more of an intervention that parents are not wanting that because for various reasons. And so um, being able to engage them and uh, be ready to participate, I think that's the difficult part that I'm seeing as we're rolling out these programs. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Yeah. Lots and that, of work to do. Lots of work to do and it, and it takes a minute, but that piece you talked about, Adela, that's the, that relationship, that handoff from the agency to the provider, the quality of that, the, the work that the case manager can do to understand those at those issues that may be happening with the family and then to pass that on to the provider. So it's not just the mechanics of, you know, the mate, you know, I made the referral, but that whole engagement with the family early on to really understand as you're planning with them around the service plan, as you're doing the assessment piece around these, really understanding what's going on with that family and letting that carry through so that they are supported. If they have those kind of issues about participating, you can find those out early. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions, thoughts? I think my only other question is we do we hit leave, leave and then go to lunch and then come back or what it, <laughs> I was I was just gonna click on it. I'm like, oh am I gonna be able to join back in? Yeah, rejoin the main session after lunch. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna stop the recording now. I'm glad we caught those interesting questions. Agreed. Thanks, Melissa, again.